Hello and welcome to the 15th video in the introduction to our workshop series, accompanying videos run by QIMR Berkhoff for Statistics Unit. Um, we've talked about what the statistics, statistics Unit can help you with before and how we service QIMR Berkhoff and Metro North and MARTA Research and their contact details. Um, today we're doing, going to be doing more with some of the functionality the Tidyverse offers. So we're going to be using the deploy package, but also um, the Megrita package there. So M-A-G-R-I-T-T-R. -T -T um, so if you haven't installed those packages with install the packages function on your computer, um, encourage you to do so. If you just want to um, watch the video, it's fine. But if we do encourage you to um, work along with the videos or attempt the exercises and activities and examples in the book. Um, we will be using the Pulse data text again for this video. So hopefully you've got that data set saved somewhere um, and can access it by setting that folder as your working directory. Um, so today's video, or this video I mean, will be section 22, which is the section that looks at pipes. So piping is a broad concept that is in terms of restructuring your order of operations. Um, so rather than nesting functions within a single line of code so that inside one function is another function and then inside that function is another function so that the output keeps um, traveling out of those functions. Um, instead of doing that, which can be sometimes hard to read what's happening where, um, pipes order the structure of your operations from left to, left to right as though you're reading it. And by separating this out a bit more clearly, um, it's much easier to add intermediate steps or change how things are running to take a step out um, and just really to follow the sequence of your operations as you're coding. Um, and one of the benefits of pipes, especially while in the tidyverse, is that a lot of the tidyverse functions, as we've talked about in previous videos, is that they pass data sets as an output. So as opposed to the earlier functions in R that we've discussed in previous videos and in previous sections where they might produce a vector or a single value. Um, a lot of the tidyverse functions will produce the whole data frame that you gave it with just one variable changed or many other changes potentially. But because it keeps passing a whole data set each time, that data set can just continuously pass through pipes to different functions you don't have to continuously make something and add it and then make another thing and add it. You can just do everything in one line of code and the data frame can just travel through it very simply. Um, in terms of the syntax for this, the syntax for a basic pipe is percent sign greater than sign percent sign. So it's the two percent and then between is a looks like an arrow. It is the other symbol from the full stop key on the um, at least on the keyboard I'm looking at, but it's a little symbol that looks like it's an arrow going from left to right, surrounded by two percent signs. Um, so, and down here we've got some examples. So if you've got a object or value, so in this case, X can be a data set, it can be a vector, it can even just be a single value. But if you have that object and then you have the piping notation and then you have your function, that's equivalent to having the function name and then the X object is the first input in your data set. Um, so when you do pipes, you don't have to write the first object in as the argument. So that, um, that first example there of X pipe function, still with the open and close bracket because the function notation needs the brackets, um, but the R and the packages underneath it will understand that if you're piping an object in, that object goes to the first argument of the function. So those two ways of doing things are equivalent there in terms of having either X written as the first argument or piping it in beforehand. Um, the second example there, if we have a function that requires two arguments, if you pipe X in, X will be given as the first argument so x piped to function with y in the brackets is equivalent to function being called with x as the first argument and y as the second argument. 
Um, so it's because some functions will always require at least two arguments, but if you can set your piping up so that the first one going through um, is the data set you're carrying through, which quite often it is, that's how a lot of functions are set up, either to have the data set or the vector as the first object going through. Um, then you can just add other inputs later on um, to the inside the brackets there. You don't need to have a comma before the Y, um, it will understand. Um, what you can do, however, is if your object that is being passed through isn't the first um, argument of the function, you can specify where the object is meant to go with argument names. Um, so there's a ways around that and you can check out the booklet for that. Um, and the other good thing about pipes that I've alluded to is obviously that you can just keep piping output from one function to the next function. Um, so x pipe to function one, pipe to function two, pipe to function three is equivalent to function one being nested within function two, which is being nested within function three. So the output, rather than traveling out, out, out of the functions, will just travel across through the functions in the pipes, which makes it much easier to read, much easier to understand what is happening, um, and it just makes coding a little bit easier sometimes. So like I just said, if your object that you're piping across doesn't um, go to the first argument, what you can do is you can use the dollar, um, sorry, not dollar sign, the full stop, um, there and to show where that object is meant to go. So if the function requires for its first argument some value that you want to provide it, you can do that. And then this, the object has to go somewhere else, you can have a comma and then where the full stop goes is where that object will go to if you want to change the default. And if it's the not the, say, the second object there, I'm um, not sorry, not the second argument there. You can um, absolutely have full control over where the object is going and say, this is the exact argument that I want to go to by specifying, say, for example, z equals full stop in the, in the function brackets if you want to have explicit control of where it's going. Um, so that's just for examples, and we'll see some of them when we jump to R and um, R Studio in a second. Another useful part of piping is variable passing. So the, oh, the big, the, um, the percent, little arrow percent symbol will keep passing the data frame object along. But if you get to a point in your line of code where you think, okay, I've done my line of code where my object has gone through all these pipes and been corrected how I wanted it to be corrected, but now I just want a couple of the variables or just one variable to come out of that, um, out of that data set, I don't want to have to worry about selecting it. I want to just like quickly go from data set down to variable or even a couple of variables. What you can do is you can use percent dollar sign percent, um, which I will understand as you're taking this um, object across this data set, but the next function is only going to be made up of variables. So you're going to want to specify the, so each input may be a different variable from the data set. Say you're doing a model or a t test where each input is a different variable in the data set. And I will understand that you don't want to put the object as an input, but you want variables from that object. Um, that's where you use the percent, dollar sign percent. Again, I understand I'm maybe taking this quickly. Um, we will see some examples in a second. Feel free to pause the video and go back over it again. Um, these videos are just like a little refresher. If you're going to the workshops or to help try and explain some concepts out loud, um, but nothing really beats going in and doing it yourself. So we'll get there in a second. The last thing before we do jump into RStudio though, is the assignment pipe, for use of a better word. So if you've made a line of code that's piping data set through a bunch of different functions, which may be transforming it, cleaning it, um, adding things, as it goes through each pipe, um, the original object is still saved as the original um, data set. So while the output from each function may be changing, that original data set won't change by the end of the last function in the pipe. Sure, the output will be what you want it to be, but that output won't necessarily override the original object unless you tell it to. But what you can do is use this eventual assignment pipe, which is between the two percent signs, um, both arrows or both greater than, both less than and greater than symbols. Um, 
So they make that little diamond shape. And if you put them in that order, what that essentially does is the data frame you put in at the start of your pipes, it will go through all the pipes, do all the transformations, and then the eventual result output will be assigned to the original object. Um, so again, we'll see some examples of that now in our studio and hopefully that will make um, sense to you. So let's jump across to our studio. Where I've got my pulse data um, object in my environment already. We've seen pulse data before. So what we're going to do first is we're just going to pass the data set to the summary function. So just going to draw that line there. Nice and simple. So this is really the equivalent of saying summary pulse data. It's the exact same thing. Um, and it, so in this most basic sense, this is exactly how you switch between the two. You go from summary open bracket, pulse data, close bracket, to pulse data, pipe to summary. And where that pipe is taking that whole data object and giving it as the first input to summary. Um, so that's, this is basic, basic piping at its most basic. Um, next example here, we have pulse data and it's being given to filter, which is a function we saw, I think, two videos ago. So in filter, the first argument is that dot data argument. And that dot data argument is meant to be what the data set is. So by piping pulse data across this way, filter, the filter function is going to know that its first argument is going to be the object being piped in. And then whatever is in the brackets is going to be the second, third, etc. arguments. So all I've got in the brackets there is height is greater than or equal to 190. So pulse data knows that, sorry, the filter function knows that the object being piped to it is going to go to the first object, the dot data function dot data input and the rest of it is going to go to the logical condition to decide the filter. So highlight that line of code, control enter. And there is my subset using the filter function of the cases where height was 190 or higher. Um, and again, like we've seen in the previous videos, the equivalent without doing pipes would have been this. We've done the exact same thing, except this time we're just piping the data in as the first um, as the first input rather than writing it in the input in the brackets. Now for these basic examples, sure it doesn't really give you much advantage, it doesn't give you much change, it's not really that much more simple, but as you start doing more things and trying to combine different steps on the one line, um, it can really make your code much more simpler and easier to read and less complicated. Um, not as long because you're combining steps into one line. So what we're doing right here was just really simple to show the concept. Um, but as you continue to build those concepts is where these concept strengths will really shine. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is passing through many pipes. So this line of code here on line 33, we've got pulse starter. It's going to be piped through to the filter function with the same condition as before. That output from the filter function is then going to be piped to the select function, where only, so the, the output of the filter function will be a data frame, as we've talked about before, how those functions output a whole data frame. So that data frame will go to the first argument in select, which is the data object that it's looking for. It will then pick only the columns that we've given it the name for. And then that output will go to the arrange function. And now the output of the select function is another data object. The first input of a range is a data object. So a range will arrange that data object by the input that we've given here of age. So my line, my cursor on that line, control enter. And here I've got just the, um, I've got just the cases of height of 190 or higher. And then I've got only those five columns that I requested, and it's arranged by age. So 18 to 19 to 21 to 25. So in that one line of code, I can see all the steps I did to that data, data set to make it have that output. And I can read from left to right exactly what I did to in what order. 
like I did earlier, I can pass output to functions. So it's not just data sets that I can do this with. I can do this with all sorts of objects. So what I've got here is I've got pulse data. It's being piped to the filter function so that we only get the male subjects. That subset is being piped to the linear model function. So we would have seen this in previous videos where we did a linear model on weight and height. So that data set is being piped there. Now, because the first argument of the linear model function isn't the data set, it's actually the formula notation for the model. Um, instead, the data object is a little bit later on. What I've got here is data equals full stop. So that R knows that the object I'm piping through, which is the filtered data set, will go to the data argument using that full stop there. The output of the linear model function can then be piped through to some summary. So rather than having to save the linear model um, as a object, which I can still do, which is still a useful thing to do, but rather than having to do that, I can just pipe it straight to the summary function so I don't have to put the object inside the summary function in a different step. So control enter on that line. And I've gone straight from the pulse data to finding the linear model between weight and height for just the male subjects and summarized the model. And I can really easily see what I've done by reading from left to right, which makes things a lot easier. Okay, the next thing we're gonna be doing is piping variables. So we've looked at the table function before and the table function took two vectors or in the case of a data set, two variables and did a cross tabulation between them. So I don't wanna pass the whole data set to the table function because what's it gonna do with all that? It doesn't have a data set input. It only has the vectors um, that it wants as the arguments. But in that case, I can use the dollar sign and the dollar sign will take, will tell R that yes, I'm passing this whole object to you so that when you look for vectors or variable names in the next function, know that they're coming from this object that I'm passing to you. So table knows all the variables of Paul Strider are coming across. So when it's got gender and smokes here, which doesn't have to be in quotation marks because it's coming through pipes, it knows to look in that data object for those variables. So control enter on this, and I get my cross tabulation. Similarly to that, I can pipe elements out of just a test output as well. So what I've got here is I'm passing pulse data to chi-square test, and I'm just gonna be getting those two variables out. But if I wanted to get the output of that chi-square test, and pipe that into something else. I can do that as well. So we've looked at before is when you say the output of a test, it has many elements to it that aren't all necessarily printed to the screen. So if I pipe a test output to a function, in which case what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna print one of the components of the output. And this is an output that doesn't show up when we just leave it like this. Um, it's one of the many um, outputs that are made by the test function. So that's why I'm gonna use the dollar sign because it's gonna pass that whole chi-square.test output to the print function. I'm gonna tell it which variable out of the print, out of the um, chi-square test output, I want printed to the screen. So control enter. And there I've got the expected values um, based on the column, number, column and row numbers. Cool. So the next thing here is that that backwards pipe of to reassign and replace the original object. Um, so I can take this on a code now to show you to begin with. I'll take it down here. So if I don't, if I just use the normal pipe there, I'm gonna pipe the whole starter across to the arrange function when I'm going to arrange by gender and age. and also descending by year. I can see how it's all been arranged. So year is descending because the negative sign, then it's been um, arranged by gender, then being arranged by age. If I wanted to keep that as um, the permanent new object as I go forward, I can just add that second back arrow there. 
So if I control enter on that, and then just use head just to see the top of it, I can see that that's now the new top of, that's how I've arranged my data set permanently now. Previously, the student ID started at one and went up to um, 110, but now I can see that I've arranged my data set by those variables there. And again, I can have many, many pipe functions to the right here. So I can pipe pulse data to filter and then to select and then to arrange again. And then after this last function on the right, that output will be piped straight back because of that left facing arrow. So this is what height looks like normally. But if I run this line of code, I can already see that pulse data is now only 59 observations. And the head of that, I can see it's changed. So when I have this back, assi back um, assignment through the piping, the object will get passed through all the pipes from left to right, and then the output will get passed back to the original object and overwrite that. So all these concepts can be combined to make your coding experience easy. You can make it really neat, you can make it orderly, you can make it easy to read for other people to come in. And so you can combine many things into just one line of code. Um, another way that good thing about this is that if you are doing lots of transformations, is that you don't necessarily have to keep all of those transformations in a data set if you don't want to. If you just want to only do that for the line of code only that it's relevant for, you can do that and not have to worry about keeping it like we've often had to do otherwise. But you can combine many things here. So we can see in this last line of code, I've got pulse data original, which is just the original pulse data object that hasn't been changed in the previous functions. I'm going to pipe that along to filter, you get only the years that are 96. That's going to get piped to mutate, where like in the previous videos, I've calculated the BMI variable. That output of that filtered and mutated data set is then going to be passed to the LM function for a linear model, where I'm going to use that dollar sign, um, sorry, not dollar sign, use that full stop to say where the um, outputted the piped output data set is going to go. I'm going to make a linear model for BMI and age. And then I'm going to pass the output of that LM function to the summary function. So I'm going to do all those different steps in one line of code. And I can see reading from left to right what I'm doing. So control enter. And that data set goes all the way through the pipes and gives me the summarized linear model of BMI to age just for the year 1996. Yeah, so that's the basic concepts of pipes, where it can, it can seem really simple as a um, small concept, but as you build them together, it can make your whole coding experience much easier to work with. Um, but obviously, the best thing to do with this type of concept is just to practice doing it. Get a real handle on it, get a feel for it by practicing it yourself, because the best way to learn R is by doing R. Thank you very much for watching.